Welcome back to the Lauren Valor Podcast. I am joined once again by award-winning independent filmmaker Sam Platiski, my favorite soulless ginger and New Jersey <laughs> resident. I'm a ginger Jew from New Jersey. <laughs> and I am joined to him of the wavy raven hair and, uh, God, that one's for Joel. Uh, Luscious Locks himself, uh, science fiction and fantasy author extraordinaire and former frogman Mike Massa. Hello, hello. A little thinner than they used to be. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry, Mike. It's still luscious. Uh, and we all get that as we get older. My, my part mind. is starting to retreat. Me too. Yeah, well, you, <laughs> but you, you at least look tell, like... Sam. Barely tell. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you just look like you were born again hard. That's all. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so we are back tonight to talk to you about Terminalist Episode 5. Um, we're marching through the series at a good clip now, and I think it's fair to say this is where... Um, uh, Unlike the tunnel scene, where you know Mike had a lot of good feedback on some of the te- some of the technical aspects of that, although I think it was still a good scene, uh, there was a lot of nits to pick. I think this is some of the funnest action we get in the and, whole and, series, and, yeah. and and more authentic mm-hmm. action. Yeah, if you remember, uh, we're jumping really fast ahead, but gosh, uh, you heard me bitching about not people people not moving together before. We finally get people moving in twos and threes covering angles simultaneously, finally. As yeah. opposed, although there's still plenty of this, you know, flippy going around <laughs> corners and trying to cover all the angles by yourself, but. <laughs> Hollywood, it man. looks good for Sam. It does. Also, running a tactical shotgun, finally. Also cool. <laughs> so you really like, I, I am not an expert on, I, I'm a competent marksman. I, I have been in combat. I've never personally run a shotgun in combat. You like the way Taylor Kitsch handled the weapon in that scene? I do. I do. Now I've never, I've never used a shotgun in combat either. Um, I've but you've at least to, trained for it. <laughs> I've, I, yeah. Mostly as a breacher, backup breacher, but I have gone to some three gun matches and humiliated myself there. And so <laughs> people uh, who are really good, and I attended a shotgun class with a uh, well, a, a multi-platform class with a guy called Matt Hot who was there, uh, and he is arguably the best tactical shotgun shooter on, on the continent, maybe the planet. He's extraordinary, um, definitely in the top ten globally. And it was nice to see tactical shotgun getting some love. Um, and I, I don't want to waste time on that, but it was just it was good to see. It it that, added. Yes. As our, our favorite bad guy character, Horn, would say, some verisimilitude. <laughs> verisimilitude, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's giving us a little more verisimilitude. I, uh, it's, so we we have Reese. This is, this is an interesting episode to me, too, because we have, for character, you have Reese pulling his friends closer in on his quest for vengeance, and he 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 gives them he gives them both like he already did this with Ben I think in the last episode but he gives Liz Riley, you know and he gives Ben at a certain point he's like hey you know you don't have to do this, but he knows they will, you know so there's it's like it's still kind of morally on you there James, uh, that that you brought them into this at one point and I really kind of the surprise character that really s- sprung out for me for this one is actually uh, Marco the the Mexican billionaire who he's very conveniently friends with. According to Jack Carr, he's like, yeah, everyone tells me that character's super convenient, but he's based on a guy I know and I'm friends with. Good for Jack. You know? um, if, if you're friends with a Mexican millionaire and you know where you're running, if you're ever on the run from, from the American law enforcement. But uh, the wife, uh, Paula, I, I really appreciated that bit of drama where she's, you can tell from like the moment to, she's met that she has this really instinctual impulse to get this person away from her family sorry about your tragedy but you are bad news reese and you shouldn't bring your friends into this yeah on the drama side so i enjoyed that she was remarkably um she was portrayed very well it was it was a nice human touch to have in what's predominantly an action uh shoot 'em up series so i like that too yeah Sam, how are you feeling about this episode as we get into probably the most epic action sequence of the show? Yeah, I mean the last the last scene is special. Well, I don't know if it's the last scene, but like the uh, the culmination of the action scene, it was just like the most brutal. And it's just like, oh, he's you know Reese is like really going like far Punisher, which is great. Uh, well, I guess we'll we'll get into the details of that. But uh, 
I did think I'm not. I think it was this episode. There was like he was was he flashing back in this episode to when his daughter was visiting that 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 same place. In, uh, yeah, so there's, there's a flashback, a couple flashbacks. Yeah, uh, when he's teaching his daughter to hunt and track. Yeah, right? yes. Yeah. So I feel like that. This is like the point where, to me, it stops being like Reese is like not sure of when he is because that happened in like earlier episodes, and they just feel like flashbacks to me, which takes away from like that aspect of like the character's brain situation. I also didn't trust Marco. I don't. I mean, like you know, we'll we'll get to like whether you can trust him or not, but I didn't trust him uh, for most of the episode. And beyond. Uh, that's the same in the book. Um, Is it really? But th that I, or at least my, I shouldn't say it's the same in the book. That was my reaction as well, both in the book, less so in the series, because I've read the book and I didn't figure they'd deviate. I mean, they deviate quite a bit, but not that much. Um, I will say, though, he is just so helpful and you don't know why um, yeah. that it, it, to me, I'm like, he's going to this is going to be a problem, right? He's going to, he's either going to betray him or he's going to want to do, want him to do something against his code. Cause he's now got this Navy seal. Who's functionally invincible. Thanks to plot armor. Um, <laughs> Mark, yeah. Marco, so falls, Marco falls in the category of character that you have to have because they allow things to happen off screen that the main character needs to have occur to advance the story. I should say the screenwriter or author has to have occur. I mean, there's yeah. a long history that I can, we could each name with ease half a dozen different shows of, you know, the cast of people with convenient skills and connections that lets the plot advance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're not wrong about that. Um, I, I, so, in the last, in the last um, uh, podcast we did together, we talked about how um, there was this notion that Reese is not on an operation like he would be in the, in the good old days before he lost his platoon. He's on a personal mission for vengeance. And we see that at the start because he's not going to, uh, he doesn't plan to interrogate his the next person on his list. He just flat out kills him. And one of my beefs of the scene is that he relies on um, you, uh, opening the guy's cell phone through facial recognition when the guy could have been shot in the face. And also he just went through a, a collision with an airbag popping off in his face, which does not leave your face unmarred very often. So yeah. if you accept that bit of fiction, and you accept that the guy just happened to have the necessary data on his phone, then okay, sure. That, yeah. That's a lot of IT hand waving happening from a technology side. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there, I, I won't debate any of that uh, at all, but I will, I feel there is, I will give them some storytelling credit for creating a sense of this guy's a massive douche very quickly without him even interacting with another human. Uh, and that is stuff that's straight pulled from the book. This that Marcus Boykin character was yanked as he was and put into the movie for his brief period that he was there. That he's having to take pictures of everything and post it on social media, and he likes his own Instagram post. And I'm like, what kind of a sociopath does that? <laughs> <laughs> you sick son of a bitch! <laughs> like, no, Charles, don't like this video, Massa. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is on my channel. You can like the video. <laughs> But if you post it, don't Instagram. like it. It's different on Instagram. <laughs> no, they. He, but this guy is almost a comically low grade douche, right? He's not. Yeah. It's not clear that he's a bad guy, bad guy, but he was involved, and that's enough. And so Reese Jackson. The most significant thing we learn in this episode, I think, isn't related. Uncharacteristically, it's not related to the action scenes. It's not Reese finding more data. It's that we find out that it isn't just Reese that had the tumor right? That's the most important thing. That sets up the entire rest of the series. That's you find out the yeah. entire platoon likely had or almost certainly had tumors. And, you know, the, the likelihood that, that would be a naturally occurring thing is effectively zero. Yeah. So now we've got a much wider spread conspiracy and we know it's not the original bad guy, the tango they are trying to kill, uh, Chemical Ali or whatever his name was. Uh, Kahani. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's something much closer to home and much, if you will, uh, much worse. Yeah. I like how at this point in the series, we have fully shed the relevance of Syria and Iran, and we've fully shed for the most part, the unreliable narrator portion of it. And now it's, it's a very focused revenge tale. Maybe they could have made that work a little bit longer, but I don't know. Like, I feel like we've got good momentum now. Yeah. Um, one thing about, so the action sequence that does stand out, um, 
I think we can go ahead and talk about the brutality of that particular kill. So he does the the tomahawk into the intestines, wraps the intestines, and has the dude walk to him or try to walk to him. Like, go I mean, ahead, we're, like we're we're sliding past a whole bunch of to some things that were super cool and some things that are like Reese getting not Reese uh, Ben getting heroically shot in the leg and you know shrugging it off. That was pretty impressive. Um, you guys he, wasn't, he wasn't really shot, Mike. It, it, it was act, he acted like he was shot. Oh. <laughs> it was a TV. No, I'm just fucking around. Yeah, good actor. But yeah, this is this is the Punisher moment. I'm I'm not here for justice. I'm just going to make you hurt for as long as I can. And I thought it was interesting that the, they showed the bad guy like with bravado, and I'm not scared of you, Navy man. And you know, and he he makes some nasty reference to how how hard the the, the family died. I'm, and I remember thinking, dude, you are really picking the wrong dude to like taunt at the last moment. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that was a remarkably, one of the most brutal on-scene killings I've ever seen on the silver screen. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and like uh, like just for, like the motivation, like you brought it up, the, the death of his family, Justin brought it up in the first episode because they don't say it in the, the first episode how they died. But the, the wife was like, you know, trying to defend, trying to like protect the daughter. And like, that was why this, because he tells it, I think he tells Ben and maybe yeah, Mark, yeah. I don't remember, but no, why right. it has to be so, why it can't just be like an op. It has to be the way he wants it to be done. The revenge that he wants. Yeah, He makes it's it so brutal. like, yeah. So like you want it, you want it to be as brutal as it is too. Maybe, and maybe you're surprised by the brutality I was, but uh, you know, you want it. I was you, surprised at how much they showed. Yeah. And I also liked it when during the pre-op portion, when Ben's like, if the guy has to die and he does, there's a way to do it that doesn't involve this really high risk plan you've got. And Reese explains, no, 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 it has to be this way. And here's why. And Ben goes, oh, yeah, OK, which makes you like Ben's character even more because, you know, he's going to take on additional risk so that his guy gets a certain amount of closure. And that's I forget the name of the film where a Ben Affleck character um, goes to Tom Hardy's character and says, hey, I need your help. Um, we're going to do some bad things to some bad people. And after that, we're never going to talk about it again. You can't ask why. And Hardy just kind of goes, huh? So whose car are we taking, right? And it was that kind of moment where Ben, the, the character Ben, the turns town? to Reese and says, okay, yeah. yeah, we're going to do it this way. And I really appreciated that level of personal bond between those two characters. That was, that was a legitimate, I mean, they, they really overdo the whole long of the brotherhood. They may bring it up over and over again, but that component is a hundred percent on hundred percent on. Yeah. I agree with that. hundred percent. Yeah. Ben is definitely a bro. <laughs> He's definitely, definitely a good bro. Um, yeah. And I do, I, I will give them, you know, give it, give it, this is the man who actually pulled the trigger on his wife and kid. Usually I, I prefer people who will still keep their head and make tactically good choices but i'm like yeah okay got this dude um you know let, let's see it um with be it noted a winkler tomahawk <laughs> um so one of the things that uh jack Carr takes uh, a small ration of shit for in his writing and in the series is he does a lot of product placement hmm. um but it's largely not motivated by sponsorships per se these are generally his friends uh he knows the guys at winkler a lot of the knives that are in the show he's friends with the black rifle coffee company people and there's black rifle co coffee stuff scattered over the set. So I think that's um, while it is somewhat um, it's a tick. I notice in both the book and the series, I can't, I can't really fault him for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And frankly, you probably Sam, I, I doubt you even you're like, yeah, it's a Tomahawk. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, I don't notice that he took the time to tell me the brand. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I didn't, I didn't at all, but he's a good guy. You know, you support yeah. your friends. You know, yeah. I try to put my friend stuff in like my movies where I can. You know, why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. The um, oh, sorry about that. The uh, the denouement so after he kills this guy, the story goes on. Um, and I appreciate that there was a bit of that they didn't end it on the really glorious part of the sequence. Um, and I also I like the idea that we get glimpses into Reese's. Uh, debilitating neurological condition is worsening. So 
even as the stakes get higher, his ability is coming down. So you're wondering where are these things going to cross? At some point, ability in, is going to go below the level of requirement, right? And that's the point of maximum danger for the character. So we're getting glimpses of that. And I really appreciated it a, a great deal. Yeah. And not to get into spoiler ter territory, but I do think it's actually fairly well done. Uh, we'll have nitpicks with that episode too. But when that comes to roost, uh, it gets really interesting. Um, and they, he does have some pharmaceuticals that can help him hold on a little bit longer, but he's clearly uh, doing something that no soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine has ever done and postponing uh, necessary medical care so he can keep operating. None of us would ever do that. Um, hey, I'm in this podcast and I don't appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, according to the people who met, who did my, my out processing of the army, I was supposed to be med boarded when I was 23 um, but I went back to Iraq once in Afghanistan once. So, and I'm not even a, a super alpha type. I was just a, a very, con very conventional army officer. So I can't even imagine what it's like amongst you types. <laughs> um, yeah. Majority of my, my frogman friends who did 20 years are hundred percent, uh, disability rated. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm only sitting at 60. Um, I imagine that's because you didn't try very hard. <laughs> you know, it's what, when I got out, I didn't, I didn't do the things that I recommend everybody does, which is document everything and get the maximum rating you can. Um, because the, I was, you know, I got out, I was still in my late twenties and I had fantasies of still being a, you know, a hard guy and they're, you know, hard guys don't bitch and whine and moan in my flawed thinking mm -hmm. about having injuries. Uh, and what I should have done is exactly what I now recommend people do document everything at the maximum rating you can. Yeah, but there are a shocking number of people with really serious injuries out of um, the last twenty years of warfare of un that have really low disability ratings, and it surprises me um, and dismays me a bit. But that's well, that's a that's a topic for another podcast. Yeah. Um, last that last word I'll say on that, and then we can get back to the episode is. Um, one of the reasons there's two main reasons I got the high, the, the rating I did one is cause it was largely related to being wounded and there was a lot of surgical reports and x-rays. So a lot of it was pretty cut and dry. And the other thing was my wife forced me into a chair with a notepad and was like, you complain about this, 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 this creaks. I hear you make painful noises when you do this, you know? So, and that's something I've actually done with every soldier, uh, every one of my friends who's still in, who's about to get out, like I call their wives if I've got their number and I'm like, listen, make him do this. Cause he's an idiot and he won't do it unless you make him. Cause I was an idiot and I wasn't going to do it unless my wife made me. Uh, and that actually probably was very, very pivotal. But anyway, that digression aside, like for any veterans out there who are not personal friends with me or Mike, for the love of God, document your stuff and get it done while you're in. Cause it's so much harder to go back to the well. Oh, yeah. It's infinitely harder. Uh, yeah. there, there is a there is a connection to this has a direct connection to the story because at this point the sec def is still talking about the debt they owe to the people who are getting used up and that's a really important motivation to the whole story and in this episode we finally get the name of a pharmaceutical company the word mm -hmm. nubellum is finally brought up in this episode and that's critical because we're going to find out how that's linked to the larger thread that's tied to the terminal list. Why the terminal list? And I don't think it's this episode. I think it's going to be the next episode. Um, but we meet the character he's going to say it to, that Reese is going to say this to. We meet the FBI team that takes over from NCIS in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, a, that's an important development because they're going to go meet Horn in episode five. And that's one of the best non-action sequences in the film i really what, enjoyed their, in their interview interview the douche yeah yeah the, the, especially when um uh, so mac tony's partner tony is the mm -hmm. main fbi agent mac is his his partner the woman who served in the army mm -hmm. as we come to find out later and i love that she notes that this douchey mcdoucherson who's out there cosplaying like he's a navy seal or mm -hmm. or delta or whatever he thinks he is has a bone frog tattoo <laughs> which is Oh boy, it's a it's a bold strategy, Cotton. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 a douchey move, 
Um, but there are team there are team guys that um, that sell that stuff. I mean, I've got one on my wall. Uh, well, you I've were known, a team guy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know probably two or three dozen dudes that have gotten killed in the last twenty years. Um, and uh, I know some of the origins of how that you know how it came about. Uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, not a lot. There's a handful of of social media sort of hidden groups where where frogmen sort of pass the word, and uh, a question comes up every so often. Hey, how'd that how bone frog wrong way, NASA? How bone frog get started? Who you know where to where to begin with? Um, and this one was laser cut out of stainless and then seracoded by a guy here in, in Coronado. So, um, good dude. How did it come about, if, if you don't mind? I mean, I'm sure that's of interest to people who want to watch the terminal list, and I don't know the story of how it came about. So is that something you can share, or is that... Well, absolutely, but I don't I don't claim to be the... I have, I have nothing to do with its origin. I was one okay. of the guys that thought... I just saw it, thought, that's a really cool image. And the mm-hmm. first image I saw, this is the one that's standing, but the one that's more famous, it looks kind of like a poison arrow frog that's skeletonized, and it's climbing like that Mm -hmm. and uh it was i think the story goes that it was something that was proposed as a hell week t-shirt rejected a lot lot of good artists and sketchers in the teams as it turns out and then the guy made it for a hat very very small scale just for his guys uh, in his immediate group a couple of them died and it became a remembrance thing where now it's for guys that passed away and that it, it morphed into that organically I don't think it began, it began as just sort of really cool, you know, bone and a frog and frogmen and, you know, skull imagery and different. And, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the proliferating, you know, Spartan Lambda and it wasn't the proliferating Punisher logo and it was just something different. Right. Yeah. Um, there's, there are a couple of, uh, I, I don't know if it's in this, in, in this term, in terminal list, but I, I, maybe it is I, where they're one of the guys who's a spec ops guy is wearing a patch that has um, uh, Edward Teach's pirate flag on it. I don't think that on, on his plate carrier. I don't think that's on this show. But that's mm-hmm. another one of the sort of iconic pieces of imagery that originated in the teams and then proliferated out. And it goes multiple ways. It goes through social media. Believe it or not, it goes through video games. It shows up in video games. And then it becomes, hey, what's, what's that mean? And, and and you know, fanboys and fangirls latch onto it, and it becomes a, a piece of interesting kit. But um, for a long time, it was just no one knew what the it, the bone frog wasn't part of popular social media, and now it is. So now I'm yeah. like, oh, geez. Uh, for the record, I've had this thing about oh, for, for a while. I didn't just get it when Turbinalist came out. I, my hand <laughs> got. <laughs> well, and that's the funny thing about um, you know, veteran-owned apparel is a big thing. Uh, probably one of the most the most famous t-shirt company is Ranger Up. Uh, Sam, if you remember the movie, there was a movie they crowdfunded and they got William Shatner to be, we talked about this like 10 years ago at this point. Yeah, and you guy, were like, the guys from Article 15. The guys from yeah. Article 15. Um, and so the, these veteran apparel companies are huge, but there's kind of a double-edged sword there that like some of the stuff they put out, anybody could wear it right like it's just funny or what what have you or a patriotic sentiment or what whatever but some of the stuff it's like you're you're very niche because really it's kind of weird i'm not saying you can't but it's kind of weird if you're not a veteran and you wear that so it's 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 just a little a little bit of oddity there of the this new um market share that's shown up in our culture post 9-11 of i mean like there were veteran you know t-shirts and everything long before this but i think they've kind of exploded in the last 10 to 15 years uh and it's kind of a weird a weird market to me where you know i see somebody's wearing a grunt style t-shirt or a uh, 11 bravos t-shirt or an article 15 t-shirt or a ranger up t-shirt and i'm like so we bros like you another vet or you just like the company oh i just like the company oh okay cool you know i'm, I'm not mad at you but like it is it is a little weird um to me uh so one thing i did want to get into is horn says probably the douchiest thing he i think he says in the whole show is i i had ambitions to join the military but my sat score indicated otherwise (laughs) (laughs) 
as a giant nerd who was also in the army i'm like fuck you dude like (laughs) like that is so much bullshit um what you imagine if someone actually said that mm -hmm. in the company of a bunch of of op- like legit straight up operators, especially if they were either active duty or just come back from somewhere super stressful, they'd go over and like take away the cameras and sanitize the area, and then they'd have a good time. Yeah, yeah have a real good yeah. time at this expense. <laughs> Talk about a lack of self awareness of your, you know, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah, and we're pushing time a little bit on this, but I did want to talk about, you know, so his comment combined with Hartley's quest to reduce the burden on special operations kind of leads me into a theme that I come to a lot um, in civilian veteran and civilian military relations is, you know, Horn's attitude of idolizing Navy SEALs in CAG, but he didn't want to join because he was too good. You know, and I feel like that's kind of a, a kind of a poetic statement on America's weird relationship with our armed forces. Cause I feel like a lot of people feel as if it's so weird to serve and, and, I personally, I kind of feel like, you know, Mike, you're kind of like the Globo Gem Purple Cobras and I'm Average Joes over here to use a dodgeball reference. But perfectly, like most of us in the military are pretty normal dudes. Um, You know, while we're in, we might be in better shape than average than the average American, but sometimes not, honestly, depending on what units you're in. But like it's a lot of us are mostly regular dudes with regular flaws who decided to serve. And I feel like this is one one of my problems is not that the special special operations community doesn't deserve every ounce of recognition it gets. It's that by the fact that our media has so hyper-focused on the special operations community, it creates the impression that the only people who serve are either the dregs with low SAT scores or superhumans who can get shot in the leg wince and get under a mountain and dig their way out and keep fighting you know like the, the, it, it creates this weird dichotomy and sam like from your perspective um do you think i'm onto something with that or do you think i'm overthinking it i think you're onto something i mean you know it, it's from like the person who's like outside of it as much as like that's why anybody I in this group it. it's yeah i mean th- that is basically what the the other parts of the world kind of like see you know You know, there's like the people who are like shit and like, you know, fuck that don't care about the military. And then there are people that, you know, like we've talked about this in the past, you know, like, thank you for your service. And, you know, like, you know, you know, you don't like, you know, you've like, you've done heroic things and you don't, you, you won't have it. You, anytime, like, like I've seen, like, (laughs) even like the word heroic mentioned near you, you don't, you're not comfortable with that at all. It but, gives I mean, that's, me that's, hives because I know people who did actual heroic shit. Nothing I did was actually heroic. But that's, I mean, um, like that's where like a good portion of our our population is. You yeah, know? And, and that's that. I feel like that's a a an unfortunate side effect of having made service weird, um, and that it's reflected in this story through the dual lenses of Hartley trying to, you know, take the heat off the people who get the heaviest burden in the special operations community. And in the person of Horn, who's a complete asshole, but combines that idolization and that uh, denigration into one person. Yeah. And I thought that was really good writing. It, it's a really yeah, it's curious how he both uh, wants to be like them and yet holds them in contempt. Mm-hmm. I'm a better version of you is what I really am, is what he's saying. That's what I got, which makes him an even easier person to hope, you know, gets to something wet and squishy happening <laughs> in a future episode. <laughs> and I do have thoughts on your comment about this weird relationship we have between, between the body politic then and our politicians and the American military, but I'll save it for our next, uh, our next increment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are, we are coming up on time. Uh, any last, I know we, we kind of glossed over again. This was the, I think this will probably go down to most people's memories as the time Reese gutted someone with a tomahawk and wrapped it around the rafter. Uh, That's but the it's episode. a good episode. That's the that's like the meat of the episode or the dessert of the episode, Literally. however you want to look at it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's the stuff with the reporter. This is Katie, right? Is the reporter? Yeah, I don't remember names. Yeah, yes, Kate. Katie and her brother and like his family, and she was staying with like staying at their place. And we got some into that. We got the FBI guy you, we glossed over, but I mean, like the 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 real the gut is the uh, you know the guy mm-hmm. losing his gut. <laughs> the way okay. twisty stuff is the highlight of the episode for sure. Yeah. Any other last minute thoughts, Mike? Nothing bad. 
<laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so, Sam, I, complete transparency for those of you who may be watching this back to back. You notice there is not a wardrobe change. We're batch recording, but I'm still going to make these guys pitch their stuff <laughs> two times in one hour. So, Sam, what's going on at Narrowbridge? Paraphrase yourself. Depending <laughs> on when this airs, we either have a Gen Con film festival screening or we just had a very successful Gen Con film festival screening. I'm sure Indiana. it was amazing. It was so good. I can't even explain how good it was. Uh, and we're, uh, you know, our, the horror anthology tales from Narrow Bridge. It's out there for film festivals. We're waiting to hear back from a bunch more. So hopefully cool. we get into some more. Cool. And Mike? Uh, hi thee to Amazon or to Hound Dog Media and pick up the copy, your copy of the graphic novel of the Black Tide Rising series by Johnny Ringo uh, as adapted and written by Chuck Dixon. Awesome. Uh, and links to all our work will be below. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, leaving us a comment for the algorithm. We appreciate it. Or a five-star review on your podcast menu of choice. That is all the time we have for the Lauren Valor podcast tonight. I'll see you next time. And until then, keep up the fire. <laughs>